I imagine more people will be filtering in as it comes in, but hi, I'm Will Sargent. Uh, I work at uh, Lightbend on the Play team, and uh, Play just recently celebrated its fifth anniversary. Um, came out five years ago now, which is really strange. So <laughs> it's good to go back and reflect over some of this, um, especially when describing um, some of it to, well, basically from first principles. So who here has heard of Play? Hands up. OK, pretty much everybody. That's great. Who here has used Play firsthand? OK, we've got a couple of hands in the back. Um, let's see. Who, who knows or thinks they know what a reactive web application is? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, th this is actually uh, an interesting sort of dichotomy and, and, and one I actually like initially wrote up these talk notes for is we, we talk about play and we talk about reactive and we talk as if we know what that means. But the truth is, is that reactive is fairly simple. It just it means different things in context and there's a set of assumptions and underpinnings that we don't usually talk about when we talk about reactive. We're just like, well let's plug this thing in here or plug this other thing in here. But we don't really talk about what we're doing and why and how this matters and how you plug this into something that might not be reactive uh, or might be blocking in some way. So Play has been around for five years, as I said. We just released 2.5.13, and we have a 2.6 milestone coming out, um, which is going to support HTTP2. So that is really exciting and real soon now. And um, because I know that the first five minutes of any video presentation is usually something people skip past, um, th we're going to start off with a little demo right now showing why we can actually call this Streamy here, which is the nickname for the 2.5x series. So we have an example here called Play Chat Room Java. I'm just going to start it up. You can see the chat rooms Java is something that we download um, off of the web pages. So if you look at the download, Play's download page right up here, you can see you can download a starter page for newbies, you can download a seed template, you can download samples. And if you download any of the samples here, the Java projects, this, one, this first one here is the one that I'm showing you, and you can actually download this and it comes with its own zip file. You just type SBT run, and then you can try this out in your own machine right now. So this thing is started up. We're going to bring up one machine over here, or one tab over here, I should say. And we're going to bring up another tab over here. So we've got two, oops. Let's bring that over there. OK, so I've got two chat rooms. Type into one, shows up in the other one. So this is a very simple play application under the hood. You want to see what it looks like? It looks like that. So this sets up a source. We have a merge hub. We send it to a broadcast hub. We set up the flow. We send it through WebSockets. And then we specify a text protocol. And then there's some stuff down that we don't show about same origin checks for security. But that is it. Text you send up into the server goes down through to all the, other, uh, all the other clients that are registered for it. And we can do that in one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code. So this is reactive streams. This is uh, the stuff that reactive streams was actually uh, originated with and was built with. Um, ACA stream, we play integrate with ACA streams seam seamlessly. And so all of the ACA streams features that we have, we can actually plug in and be able to pass through all of our streaming stuff. So that is one thing that Play can do right out of the box. Right now, you can go home and download all of this. Uh, we also have examples showing server-side sockets and uh, showing other examples of file uploads and streaming uploads and streaming downloads and things. But this gives you something to play with, like right here, right now. And the bigger question that a lot of people have when going to play is, 
they see this and they're like, okay, well, that's cool, but how does this work for my company? Like, why would my company actually want to use Play? And the answer is, Play is fast. Play is really fast. Um, if you look at Game of Thrones, you're watching Game of Thrones, you're watching something which is essentially Play. It's Major League Baseball, um, and they work with HBO, and they stream all of the stuff through WebSockets. All of the data that you see is coming through. Uh, Nitro actually found great improvements uh, using the <laughs> uh, Nitro and Hootsuite. Uh, Hootsuite, I believe, actually managed to reduce their servers by 80% or so. So they're able to just scrap them because they found out that play was so efficient. LinkedIn, LinkedIn actually moved to um, play for all of its individual REST API needs. And uh, it's, it's interesting, you should really go look at this uh, slide deck. Unfortunately, I can't really go through it myself, but uh, you can see, yeah, so here's the Hootsuite one, 80% uh, lower in cost than its AWS bill. And you can see Walmart Canada actually said that it reduced its development times by two to three percent. Uh, two, sorry, two to three times, not two to three percent. Slightly different. Um, so yeah, so a lot of people say a lot of nice things about play, and the fun answer is play is fast because we're awesome. Um, but the truth is, is that play is fast because it is a reactive web application. And the reason why that matters is because reactive web applications have a very different architecture internally. So when you're looking at CPUs, and you're looking at CPUs these days, um, CPUs these days can be fairly huge, like a Skylake processor, uh, which is the one that's actually coming out um, like early this year or something. It's got 32 physical cores on one processor. All of those CPU cores have to be fed data. A CPU is like a wood chipper. If you don't actually feed it things to do, if you don't feed it jobs, then it's essentially idle and it's just sitting there. It's not doing anything. So a big part of play and a big part of the architecture about play is to make sure that those CPUs sp stay occupied and stay busy all of the time. So whenever you're seeing Play run through something, Play has a number of clients that send in HTTP. It sends in stuff, it processes it, it sends it back out. How does it actually do that effectively? Well, the way that it does that effectively is it takes all of the CPUs, all of the cores inside of the single sing CPUs, and it says, I'm gonna create a thread for each one. So each thread, maps roughly, not always necessarily to the same core, but you've got 32 cores, you've got 32 threads. And it just keeps all of those cores busy all of the time. If you've got an entirely saturated thread pool, then you'll see your CPU go up to something like 95%. Uh, you'll get uh, great throughput. Uh, you won't necessarily get great latency because the job queue can actually wobble a bit on that. But you will get as much out of the CPU as you physically can. Um, and so play is reactive because it actually does that and it manages to do all of that by mapping functions with futures so that when you're actually calling something, you can say, I have some work to do. I'm going to send it off to where it's going to be most appropriately used. And we can get into the technical details about that. But the big difference between play and a blocking API is that if play is waiting for something, if you're waiting for something and you're doing it in play, then that's actually not a good thing. Because say you've got an eight core CPU and you've got eight threads. If you've got something which calls out to the database and you've got it calling out to the database and it's waiting for that response back, you've not just taken up a thread, you've taken out one eighth of your CPU processing capacity because while it's waiting for that request, while it's waiting for that uh, response to come in from the database, it's not giving you data back anymore and you can't render any more pages. The CPU could be doing other work, but it's not going to because you told it to do this and so it's gonna keep doing that. So, um, so reactive, reactive web applications 
take the idea that you should actually move things between different threads and different thread pools when you have some things which don't show up at the same speed. So the idea is you always keep the CPU busy and the CPU never has to say that it's bored and it needs more work. So let's start off by showing you what this actually looks like. So here is a play application. Here is the home page. So let's go over here and let's start it up. We've got SBT, the run, the build tool. And we're just going to let this go through and start itself up. And while it's doing that, I can show you the CPU, uh, the, sorry, the Java homepage showing you the manual where everything is kept. Uh, and initially, we are going to just have this run inside of a database. Well, we're going to have this run against a repository that's local. So we're not going to have anything where we are having to worry about threads or thread pools internally. And we have to worry about the efficient usage of the this, of this system. We are going to show you There we go. So here's the Play REST API. Let's bring this back up a bit. And you can see here the basic structure of a Play application. When you come in and you make a request, it's going into this index page. And you're seeing, OK, it's rendering this with the 200. And it's calling this. And when you see the views, you're seeing that this maps to this HTML template over here. and the route saying that it's going to the, the root page says is mapped over here. So we have the method over here on this side, and we have the route over here on this side. If you've seen play, it's very similar to play. Um, and then we have the functionality. And the functionality says we can go and we can see if there are any posts here. So right now we can see we've got a, uh, some JSON, and we're just going to spit out this link, uh, title, body, etc. And what this does internally is it shows you here we've got a post controller. Uh, and this goes to, so we've got a routes. This goes to post.routes. This goes to post.routes over here. We've got something saying on here on the routes inside of this. We call this lift method. This goes in here and calls out to this guy. So we have a resource, which is the thing that's rendered for the JSON. So this is in JSON style. And then we're going to have something on the back end, which takes this JSON and actually maps it through. So we've got a repository on the back end. And we're saying, when we get some data back from the database, we are going to change it up a little. We're going to add this link into it. And we're going to hand you back a resource as well. So one is a data object on the back end. We've got a presentation object on the front end. So we've got this data over here, and we've got this data over here. So this, this is what happens when you talk to the database. And then we've got this repository, which just calls list. And then that goes back to an in-memory repository here. And this is fast. Like We can call this, and we can just say, get the stream of data out, and just list it. And what will happen is, It'll just run through all of this. It'll all happen on the same thread. There won't be any latency, but, or, sorry, there won't be any delay, any waiting or blocking because it's all happening internal to the machine. And everything's cool. So that's what happens when everything is good. And we can go ahead and we can actually add uh, some metrics to it now. So we can say, we're going to add this wrapper around it called post action. And this post action is an annotation which we can say, all right, when we get this, we're going to have this metrics registry. So this is Coda Hill metrics or YAM metrics, if you're familiar with it. And we're just going to say we're going to mark this. And we're going to time it. And then when we're actually done, we're going to close it. And then if it turns out that it's not JSON, then we just say we only accept that, et cetera, et cetera. So we can do a lot right off the bat with very small amounts of code in play. But let's find out what happens when we look at a database. And unfortunately, I did set up 
a load test on this uh, using Gatling. Um, so that you can run this on your machine. Unfortunately, this is a fairly old laptop and my cooling fan broke down last night. So <laughs> it took a while for me to understand like when I was running load tests why my computer would shut down. Uh, <laughs> so I, unfortunately, I can't really test this right now, but at least I did find why my computer was making funny noises and then dying. Um, yeah, this is, these are the things they don't tell you about making slides. Um, so we've got a, something that looks like the same API, right? Okay, so this is stream and this is post data. And we've got a post controller right here and we're just calling handle find and it's calling everything and it should be great, right? So here is the, uh, let's check out this revision. So here is the in-memory repository. We're just returning the singleton list. Here is the JPA repository. The JPA repository calls this JPA API, which I love saying. And uh, then we have a couple of things in here to wrap this in a function and say JPA with transaction. And then we're pulling it out of post data over here. So if you look at post action here, uh, sorry, not post action, post data, this is actually an entity now, so standard JPA. And then you can see this is returning a stream uh, for select, and it's returning a post data, and it's returning an optional for when you want to do a get. So we are, we've expanded on the API a little bit, but it's still fundamentally, we call the post repository and it gives us data back. Now the problem is, is that the JPA repository is on another machine, and it's a database and it's JDBC is a blocking API, so it's not running at the same speed at the CPU. So if you have something that's running at a different speed than the CPU, what you need to do is set up an asynchronous boundary around it so that you can say, within this area, I'm going to use a different thread pool, and then if this thing blocks over here, it doesn't matter when it completes, the future will return me this value and this value will actually drive that result uh, back to the resp uh, that result back to the browser, uh, because we will know at the point that we actually get the computation that we can continue rendering this request. So we don't want something that's actually using post data here. We want to set up something that uses a completion stage. And completion stage is the Java util concurrent um, way of talking about uh, futures. So when you actually, when you're saying I have a completion stage of post data, you're not saying I have a post data right now. You're saying at some point in time, I have a post data to give you, but it may not be right now. And so when you say I have a completion stage, then you can take that completion stage and you can say, okay, cool, when you do this, I want you to take this and I want you to turn it into this other thing over here, and then you can return the result of that. And that is really what makes Play a reactive web application is we have the notion of threads, we have functions, and we can combine functions with futures so that we can perform a synchronous non-blocking communication so that when we have things that don't move at the same speed in play, we can actually say, here is a blocking just JPA repository, here is the p blocking post repository, and here, oops, here is the non-blocking version. And then you can say, we've got completion stage and we are doing a supply async. So let's, Bring up SBT again. And while we're doing that, I would, like, I would like to show you how we actually configure the database on the back end. So we've got an in-memory database driver. So this is a simple test database. We've got some JNDI setting. We've got some JPA. And we've got a fixed connection pool here. And the fixed connection pool is the thing that we actually wrap with the JPA post repository. So this is, if you look at it, um, 
here's the JPA configuration that we have. And then there is a formula for determining how many, how large your thread pool size has to be and how many database connections you need. And this is interesting because it turns out that the number is the number of physical CP, uh, physical cores that you have times two uh, plus an effective spindle count, which means that the number of database connections you need is like nine. So you've got a connection pool of nine, call it 10 as a nice round number. In this case, we've got a two CPU machine, so this really should be five, uh, but that's perfectly fine for now. And we just set up a, an executor and some throughput and say that we have a fixed throughput size on this side to be able to say that we want to configure a thread pool over here as well. So we've got a JPA post repository and we're saying we want a post execution context. The post execution context, when we look at this guy, calls out to the configuration that we already got and just does a lookup. And then from that, it's actually the same thing. It's a execution context executor, which maps back down to the same uh, thread pool access. So here we go. We've got ex almost exactly the same API here. We're doing the same selects. And the only difference is, is that now we're calling supply async. And we are supplying this execution context whenever we are calling this. And then on the front end, all we have to do here is we've got a completion stage which is being called out here. So this says, OK, we've got a database from the back end. We're going to take this database from the back end. We're going to turn it into a resource. And then we've got this thing over here. We're going to say we've got these posts. We want to turn these posts into a list. Then we're going to turn them into JSON. Then we're going to send them out, out of the front. And then that's all you need to do. Uh, as long as you're actually specifying that you have a different thread pool and you pass an execution context, you can, you can send in a completion stage of result to play. And the completion stage of result to play just says, get to this when everything else is good. So it will render. Then there will be another execution context that, that, that comes along. But at the end of it, you will have a joined up completion stage and it will just keep running through that. And if it's blocked, it'll do work stealing. It'll move on to something else. So those cores will always be kept busy. So let's see that at work. How's this going, by the way? Am I going too fast, too slow? All good? All right, good. Yeah, so um, I just... Let's see, GitHub. Yeah, yeah, that's a Java chat room example, but we've got a Java REST API example. This guy. OK, so this is the finished version. So if you go to github.com and you go to play framework uh, Java, play dash Java dash REST API dash example, this is that, this exact thing. Uh, it's got a couple of extra things that we'll get to. But uh, you can see, um, and, and we don't have like the, the blocking stuff, but we do have a timeout post or post story. So that's fun. Um, so yeah, so we've got the JPA in the background. We've got a handler sitting in between it just doing the presentation. And the reason the handler is important is because like right now we're doing JSON as the back end, but we could, uh, we could be doing XML or we could be doing HTML. And so we want to be able to do to switch easily between content representation with the same data. So that's where this comes in. And um, yeah, on the front end, we've got the post controller. And this does what you expect. And then we've got the action sitting in the middle saying, OK, when we got all of this, go ahead and do this. And you can see here, there is a little extra code here, because when you do a completion async, if you get an exception in this, we want to be able to say, don't give us any details or anything. Just return a server error. So the way this looks, HTTP. Uh, 
And one of the nice things about um, Play is it actually has a hot reload feature built into it. So as we recompile code and touch it, we can do that on a running server and just have it immediately match up. And here I actually changed the type of this guy. So I may have to do that because this was actually an integer and I changed it to a long. So let's jump up to the top. And we've got SBT, type run, use the built-in server over here. And now we've got some call this. It's going to give us a 404, I think, because we've got not got anything found here at this point. So it goes ahead and compiles the two codes, which are the two things which actually changed in the last one. Uh, we called a circuit breaker because that's what I was playing with last. So here we've got an empty list. So okay, we're going to go ahead and we're going to say. Let's do a post. Let's call this again. And then let's uh, repeat that with the post. Oops. And then we can say, all right, now you can see that there's a different ID every time, and it comes up. Now, one of the things we want to do, because we have a project that we are putting together, and we have a database call, um, we've got play working fast, but we still need to be able to do something so that if we, get, if we don't get a response from the database back fast enough, we can still return uh, something. So what we actually have here is we have a timeout. So you can have a, a non-blocking timeout that you use in play that says, you've got a completion stage over here, and you've got uh, an incoming database request happening. And if this render doesn't happen within this amount of time, render this other future instead, which is going to give you a gateway timeout. So this tells you that something didn't work in the back end. So we go ahead and we say, all right, do it. Um, where is the timeout? So this says here, we have a timeout wrapping this do call. And then we also. If the database is acting up and is not returning any results at all, that is, the database is completely down, we don't want to waste any time in being able to tell the user that the database is completely down, or it might be overworked. We're just not getting anything back. We've just got too many error messages. So one of the things that we can do here is inside of the post repository, we can set up a circuit breaker. And this circuit breaker, we'll just put a get around the lookup. This get, uh, this get will actually wrap this checked exception here, this SQL exception. And so when we call uh, this guy, then you can see we've got a service unavailable. The service unavailable is because when we got up to this post action, it went through and it said, we've got a fail safe exception, and therefore the circuit breaker is open and let's return this as, as instead. And so this gives you a play, a play application, a reactive application, which uses the database the most effective way that it possibly can, uses the CPU the most effective way that it possibly can. Uh, the memory uh, play is stateless, so you can throw requests that are all day and all night, and it won't keep hold of any HTTP sessions. And it works in mechanical sympathy with the machines that you've got. So the, mem memory, yeah. the memory that you are actually using is for the request itself. It lives in Eden. It's really easy to garbage collect. You can handle a lot with a fairly small um, GC uh, a heap size. And you don't have to suffer from the GC overhead of having uh, huge uh, heaps that you have to run through all over again. So <laughs> um, 
So yeah, that, that is the best practices as far as I can make them um, in, inside of a uh, one hour slot for talking about uh, a blocking database and how to make play work with blocking APIs on the back end. Um, so at this point, um, I would like to show you a couple more cool things. One of them is, uh, in addition to the thread, what have we got this thing? We have, um, we have the ability to render things, not just for a single page, and not just streaming um, for JSON. So if you have a single page web application, Play is really popular for those. Um, so um, LinkedIn uses it for a lot of React stuff and a lot of Ember stuff I know. They have something called Pemberley. Um, but they also, uh, um, LinkedIn did something really cool where they said, let's actually use threads to our best advantage and let's start rendering a lot of different things at once. So this is something that's called big pipe or pagelets. Uh, this particular example is called pagelets, where you can actually render different sections of the page in parallel and have them all filled out as they're coming in. So all of this, you pull in a request, it kicks off several requests to the back end. All of that data comes in, it all turns into futures. And as they come in, all of this page, each section of this is actually rendered individually. And if it times out, only that particular section times out. So that's cool. Um, and we also have um, a number of modules here. Here, modules. So we actually have a modules directory which talks about all of the different things you can do with API hosting, assets, sprite, authorization, authentication, data store, database migration, etc. There is a lot there. Um, Play uses Juice underneath the hood, but we actually have the option of working on Spring. Uh, or you can actually use compile time dependency injection. So you can actually get play working on Dagger 2. And at that point, you can simply say all of this stuff, if it doesn't compile, if it doesn't actually have a dependency for it, the code won't actually compile at all. And that just means that whenever you're running play, you can run play completely secure in the knowledge that you're not doing any runtime dependency injection at all. OK, all right, so I feel I've talked rather a lot. Um, I would like to open the, uh, the panel open. Um, I would like to open the floor so that if anyone has questions, uh, I can fill you in. And also, I'd like to know what it is that you're doing and what it is that you're interested in play for and doing things with. OK, so who's interested? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that that really goes back to um, so if you look in the application.conf, here it's sized to the Kapari, Hikari uh, connection pool, and here you can see um, there is a page, and it's called uh, Hikari CP about pool sizing, where he talks about the algorithm for determining how many requests a second you can actually get out of a CPU, out of a database. And um, th this is oriented towards the max number of connections on the database side. So here I did cheat a bit because I assumed we only have one play application server. And so the number of play application servers that you have, you have to divide by that to make sure that it matches the total on the database side. Um, but for this, we've got a one-to-one, -one, so this is fine. But you don't need nearly as large a pool as you think you do. Um, and you should also be load testing in all cases to be able to find out where it is that you're getting uh, data uh, not working. Um, in terms of doing the best possible tuning, it turns out that Lightbend has a production suite which has a fantastic monitoring option. Um, it's available very cheaply. And uh, well, I shouldn't say cheaply, but it's very cost effective. 
um, because it knows exactly what all of the threads, it knows exactly what Acker is doing internally, and it can tell you where your overhead is. Um, so yeah, if you're going into production, um, I highly advise that you have all of your monitoring and operations set up uh, because it really does, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you can get the best possible performance out of play. Um, having said that, you know, like CPU time is expensive. I didn't realize how much servers actually cost until like I saw the bill one time and I was like, okay, all right. That, now I understand why people are intent on saving money on AWS. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is actually, Hikari CPE is the connection pool that Play uses underneath the hood. And um, he's written quite a lot about uh, performance and about uh, getting the best possible optimized uh, uh, load out of the machines. So he's done quite a lot of work and he's fr frankly more than willing to talk about it. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff. Okay, yes. Yes. What we like about it is that it's got lots of integrations into the JavaScript world, so you can use Gradle for our front end and our back end. Yep. Um, so we're still on Play One, and part of why is because we didn't. We know there's there's Gradle support for Play Two, but it's still second part. Can you, or, may, or maybe that's incorrect. Now. Uh, yeah. So if you go to the Play Framework download page. Um, the seeds actually, uh, the, we've, we have been gradually rolling out um, the Gradle support because we're still not sure about the fine edges of it. Uh, I'm personally far more familiar with Play. But uh, if you download and start up a new project, uh, Play Java Seed or Play Scala Seed, then you can find that there's a, a Gradle file inside there to just run it and it has hot reload capabilities. Uh, and I know that LinkedIn uses this extensively. All right, questions? All right, cool. Thank you very much, you've been uh, great. <laughs>